Are you at your point where you think you've hit your bottom or maybe that there's just no way you're ever going to feel like things can change? I was like that. I really was. And I want you to know, my name is Bromo, by the way. I want you to know that there is a way out. Please join us for my podcasts. Well, I'll tell you, you blink an eye, <laughs> three weeks goes by. <laughs> and the time goes by so fast. But I'm so glad I'm back. I'm here. My name is Bromo. There is a way out. This is what this podcast is called. I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is 2-17-09. My uh, sponsor lives in San Diego, of all places. We're best friends. His name is Dave. I, uh, like I've said before many times, truly am so uh, amazed by the guests that I have continuously that come on. They're powerful. They all speak their own story. Everyone has something to add. Doesn't matter. Like I've said many times, if you have 45 years of sobriety or four days of sobriety, everybody learns something from everyone. We're all on the same mission, the journey. My stepbrother once, when he took me out to the boondocks in the desert for my first recovery out in San Diego, way out there, he said to me, you know, this might be the best thing that's ever happened to you. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't belong here. And he says, yeah, I think you do, as we rolled in. Um, I'm going to introduce this next guest. I met this uh, young man, if I can call him young man, Clayton. How are you, Clayton? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm well. Clayton Meyer is his name. I met him through another person that spoke uh, and it did a terrific job. And we were just talking about that off the air named Bill. And this is how we all roll, kind of. We meet each other just for a second. We have a lot in common as far as a special bond of trying to stay sober of trying to help other alcoholics and addicts out. And I, I only know a little bit about Clayton. So I'm going into this almost as blind as everyone out that's going to be listening. I do know this, though. I do know this, that this podcast is designed for anyone who, whether they're going through it or maybe they have a friend or a family member that they seem to think that could be in trouble. All I ask is if you just give a couple of my podcasts a listen, not just because of my story, Although if you want to start out number one, you can. But just for the all the other guests that come on and talk, because you may find something that you can relate to. You probably will. Clayton, what kind of age are you, if you don't mind telling us, our audience? And by the way, welcome to There Is A Way Out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I am uh, 58 years old. You're just a young pup. You're a little bit younger than I am. Are you? And you're from Bismarck, is that right? <clears throat> I am from Bismarck. Born and raised here and... Yeah. Uh, Clayton asked me to please ask a lot of questions, and I ironically laughed because I tell everybody <laughs> that comes on, I say, look, <clears throat> excuse me, I say, look, there might be a time where I interrupt and it streaks of here and there and here and there, and I interrupt, and I want you to go back. And I apologize if I do, Clayton, but I do that for a reason. I don't want to lose my train of thought, and I want you to convey exactly what you were saying, and I want people to hear that again, so... Now that we got those boundaries out of the way, just be prepared for some interruptions if you don't mind. I'm totally cool with that. Sometimes I've uh, I just was sharing with somebody the other day. We were talking back and forth. Another gentleman I know that's been in recovery for over 43, 44 years, almost 44 now. Yep. Um, I told him I said I, I forget what it's like to be new sometimes, and I and I I catch myself. Uh, living in the solution, forgetting about what the problem was, you know, it, it, it's difficult at times. And, and so I try to keep myself really close to like newcomers and, and people that are fresh in recovery because it keeps me sharp and it, and it, and it always reminds me where I came from. This is what I always used to, used to call bull S on uh, Clayton. When I was younger, when I was brand new, I used to think, why did listen, all right, Mr. Old Timer, you're telling me you're going to learn something from me? You're telling me that you need me just as much as I need you? That's bull. But exactly what you said, you probably still love to see that shining look on somebody's face of recovery love when it. they're, Absolutely but yeah, love that it. pink cloud. I don't like care. little candles. Yes, it is. <laughs> little I don't candles. Care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're like me, Clayton, you don't care if it's called a pink cloud or whatever. You know that that's the bright light of somebody turning their life around. That's the start of it, isn't it? 
that's the start of the uh, spiritual awakening, in my opinion. Yes. Is that you're starting to see that there's life without, you know, that this this is actually a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I am the least important person in any room. In any meeting I go to, I consider myself the least important person in the room. Well, I'd have to disagree. Uh, I am, I am I'd have to disagree really with you on listen. that. I'm gonna disagree with <laughs> well, you on that, Clayton. I'm gonna. Well, you can. It's okay. But <laughs> I'm gonna it's, disagree it's, to disagree, but I'm gonna disagree on what you said. I I understand what you're telling everybody, and that's so modest, and that's one of our shining graces. Um, although my sister and I, who's a normie, and you and I both know what that means, a normie to everyone else. I got is, one of those too. <laughs> Man, a normie is someone that can have a six-pack of beer in the refrigerator for about five days without even touching it. Um, my no- my sister used to be a little bit peeved by certain people that would come on and act like, I deserve everything. I'm going through it way more than anyone else. I'm an alcoholic. Please now pay attention to me. I deserve all this and this and that. I get it. I get it because it is a selfish program, but it's got to be. It's got to be selfish, and this is why people like you, Clayton, come along and fine-tune them when you when you meet with them, I believe. But we're going to get into your story. How long have you been sober? What is your sobriety date? Uh, my clean date is January 6th of 1986. You remember every single second of that date, don't you? Just about, yep. I sure do. And you and I have a lot in common. If you're like me, your favorite day of the year is that date that you just gave us, isn't it? It is, kind of quietly. I, I don't like to, this is really weird, my, my sponsor years ago made me start um, recognizing my clean date, you know, when they go around the meeting, at, around the room at meetings, you know, yeah. for the anniversaries and stuff like that to get your coin or whatever. Yeah. I used to not do it. Um, because well, I didn't, let me ask you this, why? Why? Because I didn't want people to think I'm different that somehow I've got this, I felt like I got put on a pedestal. Yeah. And it happens to this day Yeah, when you go in a room and people learn that you have 38 years clean, yeah. you're immediately on a pedestal, and I don't like it. Uh, yeah. I, I want everybody to know that there are days where I struggle just as much as that person with three days clean. Uh, I want to know that what that struggle is. Away. Clayton, what is that struggle? Is it the struggle for the need of getting high again or just having one beer like a normal person? Is it, is it the, the wants and the urge? No. No. No, it's not any of that for me. That's, that's gone. I don't even think about that anymore. Right. Uh, what, what the struggle is today is learning how to, to deal with problems and people like normal people do. You okay. know, I believe, I believe that when we're born into this world, we're all born perfect. Okay. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, people like you and me got lost, and we didn't pick up on these principles that, you know, a lot of people call them spiritual principles. I, I don't know that they're necessarily spiritual principles, Yeah. Uh, but they're principles like, you know, honesty, open-mindedness, um, you, you know, things like that that we learn along the way. Uh, somewhere along our journey, we got a little lost, and we didn't pick up on those spiritual principles, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still trying to learn and live by those today. And so that's where my struggles come. You know, if I'm at work and and I'm having a bad day to, you know, let's not try to take it out on somebody else. Let's not make my bad day turn into somebody else's bad day, or let's not make their bad day turn into my bad day. Yeah. You know, that, that happens too. So that, that's where the, you know, the, the struggle is today. It, it's not about, you know, that I wake up and I think I want to get loaded or anything like that. That's, that's all gone. I couldn't imagine that today, even. Well, let me ask you this. It, it, um, it, do you find yourself sometimes um, holding back your sobriety date because you feel like you may intimidate somebody? And I'll give an example. When I was three or four years sober, I'd always come across someone at a meeting that was like six or seven years more sober than me. And, you know, they would get around a group of guys and they'd say, ah, you know what? Four years is awesome. But just, you know, come around when you get to 10. And then we'll tell you, know, like they're kind of like kind of like not trying to maliciously put you down, 
but they always wanted to make sure they had more sobriety than you and they knew more about this and that. Did you ever feel like you may, even to this day, intimidate somebody, like you said, a newcomer who finds out how many years you're sober? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I remember that happening. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was a member of a of a 12-step fellowship for years, and, and that seemed, oh, well, not years, that's not true. I got kicked out um, <clears throat> after my first few meetings, but that's really how it was, is that everybody sat around and you know told the war stories and talked oh, about yeah. how long they'd been sober and yeah. it just drove me nuts it just drove me nuts and i and i kind of vowed to never be that person and, and i don't do that i really don't talk about my using days and and i do that for a reason and it's purposeful and yeah and i i talk about recovery and what i'm doing today and 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 how I find my recovery and things like that. But yeah, the intimidation factor is, is huge. I don't ever want to intimidate anybody that, in fact, if you've ever been in a meeting that I've been in, um, I will, I've said it a million times. I've been so, I've been clean since, you know, six o'clock this morning when my alarm went off. Right. And, you know, we're all, we're all on the same playing field today. Okay. Well, let me ask you something. Okay. Um, what, uh, what makes you what makes you makes you think that I think I could learn that no what makes you think that you think that you can learn from someone like me who's only half as sober as you I'm 15 years sober and you're how many 38 38 so what makes you think you that that you could learn something from me even 15 years sober this is what I want to get the mindset out to people out there because people learn from everybody. So you think you can learn something from me, Clayton? I can. I can learn something from everybody. Uh, that's the beauty of this program. Is it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't matter if you've been clean a day, yeah. a year, ten years, yeah. thirty-eight years. It doesn't matter. I'm going to learn something from you. How though? And thirty-eight years is a long time. That's half my life, is. and then some. So how is it? You've how, probably how, how, heard so many things and so many stories and so many people sharing. How is it possible you can still still learn something? This is what I want to put on you. Well, because when I when I can get in the mindset of practicing these principles, I can pick up on other pe- principles that people are practicing and that and that they're very good at. Yeah. And sometimes I get the opportunity to point it out to them as well. Oh. Say yeah. hey, do you, do you see? Did you hear what you just said? Yeah. I wish you could yeah. hear me through my ears. Right. I wish you could hear what you said through my ears because it made so much sense. Yeah. Isn't that something? And, Isn't that something? And if I can, if I can put it together in my head, uh, then I can teach it. You know, that's that's the beauty of that. Is once I once I hear something, and I learn it, then I can teach it. Yeah. To, to the next person and the next person and the next person and they, and they can teach it and um, it, it's amazing one of the things that's been I've been amazed by in recovery is, is my first sponsor uh, was many 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 years sober mm-hmm. uh, he was from Moorhead, Moorhead Minnesota he, he died sober many years ago and it took me about probably four or five years to start getting a grasp on this being clean thing yeah, and to changing my lifestyle and talking a different way and uh, ju- just to get a grasp. Yeah. And as the years have gone by and by and by, you know, if when I get somebody new that I sponsor these days, really I can have them if they're open-minded and willing to put in the work, because I can't do it for them, yeah. I, they can move mountains in six months. Yeah. What took me five years to learn. Right. It's, it's amazing to me how this just progresses and progresses, and we, we move people along very quickly. And if they're willing to put in the work and truly uh, change their lifestyle, well, maybe not their lifestyle so much, but their thought process certainly. Uh, they're going to be amazed at the, the the change in their life. All right, I'm going to throw something at you real quick. Um, how could you, at 38 years sober, long time, 
How could you possibly remember the urge and the angst of having to drink one more time or that want and that need, waking up in the morning and wondering when you're going to get your stash of uh, booze and set that aside so you can get drinking at 2 o'clock in the afternoon like I did. How can you possibly remember what that, what that, what that felt like? I'll bet you you can, and I'll bet you remember every single second of that haunting fear. And I'm, trying, I'm really trying to hard not to make this all so dramatic, but it was for me when I relapsed. It was seriously like a nightmare that would not go away, and it was real. And I kept telling myself, this is not happening. This is, this is just, I'm going to wake up, right? This is not happening. And that nightmare was freaking real. How could you possibly even remember what that was like? I, I can go through it. I, I could um, go through it in vivid detail. I remember it like it happened 15 minutes ago. Yeah, isn't that something? It, it, it's just a. It's it's. I don't know if it's trauma or or what it is, but I remember it like it happened 15 minutes ago, and and I think I think it's the desperation where you where you've never been so desperate in your life yeah. as you are toward in, in the middle and toward the end of your using oh yeah the 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 desperation and 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 we won't change yeah until the desperation to change becomes greater than that than that desperation say <laughs> say that again we we won't change until the desperation to change becomes greater than the desperation to use. Yeah. Yeah. You remember being on your knees and just being completely done? You remember like just, um, and I can't, I, sorry oh, the, if I, the sorry. Powerlessness yes. Crazy. Sorry if I keep bringing things back to me. And this is one of the things I wanted to no, apologize no, 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 to everybody. Okay. Everybody that's been on my podcast in the past, sometimes I ramble a little bit and cause I like to draw back memories of my own. I remember the last time I relapsed, it was already in my head. I pretty much almost relapsed mentally. I really did, but physically I had, and I picked up my keys, and I walked through that alleyway so nobody would see me, and I went to that store, and I saw that damn drink behind the, the glass, and I knew I was going to get it, and I knew I hadn't even clicked it open yet, walked back with this awful desperation, like you said, trudging through the alleyway, waiting to get up to my second-floor room that was covered with empty medicine bottles and crap like that. I popped that thing open, put that first sip in, and I started crying. I was crying because I lost. I was crying because all that. And remember, people will say to you, right, Clayton? Hey, is it really true that you can go how many years and you can relapse and then you'll go right back to where you were? And I say right back to hell and even deeper. Yeah. Yeah. All your misery. Right back in your lap. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it, I, uh, relapse is not part of my story. Uh, however, trust me, and you know that I've seen it over and over and over oh, again. Oh, I'll bet. And and bad, like death, and and you know, um, someone someone leaves, and you don't see him again, and they're gone. Yeah, it's horrible. And yeah, and then you hear about that they you know OD'd in the paper or something like that. That's that's tough. Especially when you're their sponsor. That's, yeah. that's oh. tough when you get those phone calls. And did you hear that so-and-so overdeed? It's like, holy shit, what, what happened here? I know. I know. You know what? At that point, I've, yeah. I've had people that I've loved and and have known that have gone lost for a while. and I, I think I tell everyone this, and I'll tell you, and you'll you'll agree with me. I know you will. When I went to my first recovery place, and it was a place with about 40 other people guys all of us in rows and the teacher said to me very first day in hey take a look around you take a take a take a look around all the rows behind you take a look to everyone by you after about a year if three of you are still sober that's about the odds and i remember thinking bs bs mr dramatic but that i tell everyone how true that is oh it's, it's it couldn't be more true yeah. yeah, I I went to I went to, when I was in treatment there was 78 of us in inpatient treatment and uh to my knowledge uh there was there's two of us God. 
that stayed clean. So, Clayton, why should we continue then? Here's another thing. And you don't mind if I keep doing this to you because I, I like the fact that you can listen to some of the stuff I say and you can relate. Our old cook used to say to me, look, I know one day I'll probably drink again, but for today... I'm relatively sure I'm not going to. And I'm like, look, if you're so sure you're going to drink again, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you go down to that bar that I'm looking at, which is about a quarter mile away, and do it now. Because today, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to drink again. And I remember thinking, you know, what you had just said, Clayton, if that's the odds that are thrown in us right away, why don't we just say, forget it then. I can't make those odds. I'm going to go ahead and just go back to my lifestyle. Why should we start? Why should we think there is a way out, Clayton? Well, I think it's important because we have to <clears throat> we have to take on a different mindset for 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 so many years. Uh, well, let's let's look at treatment facilities, for instance. And don't get me wrong; I'm not bashing any treatment facility. It's not their fault. Right. Uh, it's what it's what the insurance companies have dictated and everything like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's not their fault. So, no. so you put a person in treatment for 28 days or whatever it might be, and you you kick them loose and and expect that they're going to stay clean. Yeah. Well, the likelihood of that happening is slim to none. Yeah. Without without some great intervention by whether it be family or uh, you know a 12 step program that they go into or a, a, a recovery house or a halfway house or something yeah uh, the, the recovery houses have been absolutely huge the you know the the ones we have here in Bismarck like you know I, I, I don't want to single any out but like you know hope Manor and blessed builders all of these places where these people can go live and integrate back into society amongst silver people yeah uh, is incredible it is. Uh, I was out. I was out in Philadelphia um, many years ago. Now I was I, I I was the delegate for the state of North Dakota for the recovery week, and I went out to Philadelphia and spoke out there and and took in all of the recovery week festivities. And I was just absolutely amazed at how many recovery houses were out there. And I was it just blew me away that this is the new I don't know. I don't want to say new because maybe it wasn't new, but it was new to me. Mm-hmm. But this is a new way to get clean and not guarantee success, but your odds of success were pretty great when when you're living in a in a sober house with a whole bunch of people that are trying to, you know, get a new lease on life and try to stay clean. Well, you couldn't have said it, it more perfect. It was perfect. amazing to me. Yeah, you couldn't have said it more perfect right there. A new lease on life. Yeah. And you know, well, I don't. I don't know if I answered your question. I don't know what your question was. <laughs> oh, what are why uh, the odds? So, yeah. so unless, in in my opinion, unless we can get a grasp on these principles that I talked about a little bit ago, we have to get a grasp on these principles because yes, our odds are pretty slim. Yeah, they are. They're quite slim because all we know is what we know, and if I'm willing to. If I'm willing to wake up every morning and say these words, I don't know what I don't know. Yeah. So there's a lot of things out there that I don't know, but that person that's walking in the room that has three days clean, they're going to teach me something today. I know they are. So I don't know what I don't know. So shut my mouth, open my ears, and I'm going to learn something today. Yeah. I don't know everything. Uh, I know this is that my clean date is January 6, 1986. I've been clean for 38 years. And I, on next January 6, I plan to say that I'm clean for 39 years. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to listen for the answers. I'm going to listen for things that make sense to me and that I can incorporate into my life and teach to others. I love it. I, here's the thing I love, Clayton, about talking to you in the 24 minutes we've spent. Um, normally I go right to somebody and I say, Let's hear your story so other can hear hear your story. Right now, I'm kind of trying a different route here. You 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 have 38 years of sobriety. Um, your story is I'm probably guaranteed that your story is amazing. However, I know by just listening to you, and so humble you are, your point of when you speak is not necessarily to go step by step by year by year of your torment and your hell, 
what you're doing now is simply talking to me about recovery, and I'm enjoying every single second of it. And, and, and for the newcomers who are probably thinking, well, let's hear the story. You've heard a lot of stories. This right now, you're listening to a man who's got a lot of experience of uh, being their sponsor, a lot of experiences with watching others, unfortunately, relapse and disappear or death, um, what, being in meetings and listening to others. This is such a huge part of what we're all about by helping each other, by doing this, hopefully, this podcast, or listening to you speak in Philadelphia or wherever you're at, Clayton. And and by the way, if you are more than welcome to tell me anything you want about your past, but I can already tell that you're the kind of guy right now that's in the present that's completely focused on letting people know, like you just said, I don't know what I don't know, which is pretty damn smart. Because the newcomer is just in a world of hurt. They're not sure what their future is going to be. They probably had come from just a horrible, either lost a job or, or their bottom. And they're thinking, man, I don't know if I can stay sober. And then when they get to, I do know I'm going to ask you about something, Clayton, in a second, my favorite thing to ask. But am I, am I kind of dead on about what I'm saying so far about you? Absolutely. One of the, I'll share with you why I don't really talk about my using. Um, okay, so my my thoughts about that are that our stories, so if you put 100 addicts, alcoholics, whatever, in a room, our stories are quite similar. The details might be different, but they're quite similar. And so... One of the things that I look at is that if a newcomer, and this is what I think to myself all the time, if there's a brand newcomer in the rooms of the 12-step fellowship that I frequent, yeah, is that really what I need? Is that the message I want to send? I have about some between three and five minutes on my share during, <laughs> during a meeting. Right. Is that really what I want to share with them? That's not really what I want to share with them. I want right. to share a message of hope. Hope. Of hope. That's all I have. At the end of the day, that's all I have is some hope. Because we all have the story. And, you know, that I, that I don't care to relive anymore necessarily. So my goal in life is to send that newcomer out of that meeting with something, something in their toolbox that they can go out into the world with. You know, like... Uh, one of the things that I like to say is that, you know, our, our steps are kind of a give up, clean up, make up, and keep up. Right. You know, the steps, one, <clears throat> steps one, two, and three are about surrender, give up. Four and five, clean up your inventory. Six, seven, eight, and nine, you make up. That's the restitution, the reconciliation. Ten, ten eleven, and twelve, there's your spiritual currency that you get to walk out into the world with. Yep. Those are your maintenance steps, your keep up. Uh, it, it, unless you have that spiritual currency, when you walk out the door, you're no better off than you when you walked in the door. Yeah. And and, so, and, 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 and and the other thing, if you've ever sat around a meeting and listened to people talking about using, yeah, it's it's like like a bunch of dopers at a crack house. They <laughs> lean up on the table and they want to hear that I dirt, know. you know. Yeah. And it's like, come on. <laughs> well, here's the thing, Clayton. So I, ironically, I just try not hard not to do it. Ironically, like 10 minutes ago or so, you had just gone through saying that you felt like, what was your exact words? You go into a meeting and you feel like you're not much help to anybody or something like that. You stay kind of in, you don't think it matters how many years of sobriety. I think that's what you said that you have. And you just said a second ago, when you're up speaking for the three to four minutes or whatever they give you, you have a message of hope. And do you know how huge and powerful that is? Because you're right. A lot of people will go up, and to those who have never been to a meeting, and I'm not knocking it, Clayton knows this, but there are those that will go up, and, man, they will, they will start telling every single gosh darn awful story in their world which led them to drink or use, and it's horrific. It is. But for me, the message of hope is how you put it, is what the newcomer can cling on to. And say to themselves, man, that is a message of hope. There's a guy right in front of me, 38 years, who just spent four minutes telling me a message of hope. 
That's pretty brilliant. That's pretty cool. And that's that's why when you go to a meeting, look around for a little bit. If it's your first one at the first place, you'll see the usual things you'll see at almost every meeting. You'll see the new, the newcomers, the scared ones. You'll see the veterans, the old timers is how they put it. Um, and like, like Clayton said too, not every meeting is great. Unfortunately, there are some meetings, somebody will be an a-hole and they'll scorn you and they'll say stupid stuff. And, and they might even turn you away from going to a meeting for a while. And that happened to me. Yeah, it's, it's happened to me in a, in a different fellowship. Like I said, I got kicked out and, uh, they told me that wasn't the place for me. And, and, uh, luckily I was, I was a very fortunate yeah. Uh, when I got clean, my dad is uh, um, in in recovery for, oh, my gosh, over probably 45 years God, or more. No more kidding. More than that, even. Wow. My, my oldest brother is in recovery for over 40 years. <laughs> and my next brother is in recovery for probably over 20 years now, and myself. And then I have this normal sister. Uh, which, yeah. which we question whether she's really our sister. Yeah. But, uh, I'm just kidding. We don't. But no. uh, yeah. But so I was fortunate. You know, when I got kicked out or, or, or invited to leave and not come back, basically, I wasn't kicked out. But uh, they didn't like my message, and and so they told me that wasn't the place for me, and 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 I never went back. And you know, without all that other support around me that might not have bode so well as it did. So what's your family like? Again, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have uh, two older brothers and a younger sister. Okay. And your dad is still sober. You said he's been sober for how long? Oh, gosh, over 45 years. Amazing. Do you remember the times when he drank? I do. Okay. I do. And uh, do you have a mom? I do. Yep, and, they're they're together still, and and she did. Yeah, she, she, she was probably a normie. normie. She was probably a normie and didn't yeah. have any issues with it. Okay. Yeah. Um. I, I don't like to bring this up because sometimes people think I'm sitting there and I'm I'm preaching. I'm not, but I have my own philosophy and my own feeling. But I know somebody told me in the book, and I'm not an expert, Clayton, in the book. And there are some people that really are. But I've had and I've heard people say. Quote, oh, yeah, I'm recovered. R-E-C-O-V-E-R-E-D. I'm recovered. I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I always used to think, no, you're in recovery. You're still, let's just say you can't go out and have a beer or anything because you are an alcoholic. You're not recovered. Am I offbeat on this, Clayton? You know what topic I'm talking about, right? People, when they say, I'm recovered. You're not. You're not cured. You're you're not recovered, uh, and there's no shame in saying you know, that you're it, in recovery, right? No, there's no shame in that. None. I, in fact, in today's day and age, it's becoming less and less shame uh, because because I think we're so part of, part of that uh, stigma is is going away. Yeah, it really uh, is. The, the stig the stigma is different today than it was 38 years ago. Uh, society has become more tolerant of of recovery. Um, but I do understand what you're saying. I've heard that as well in meetings, the yeah. recovered. Yeah. And, and all that says to me is that you're no longer open to suggestion. Yeah. So if you're recovered, why are you here? But I had somebody on a while ago who says to me, quote, it says in the book, it says in the book that you're recovered. And I'm like, I, okay, I don't know where it says that. And uh, I'm not going to disagree <laughs> with with the guys who came up with the, our golden book, but I'm just saying I don't believe that I'm ever going to be recovered. I know myself so well. So I, I'm i sorry if I brought up any I de- hope that debate. I'm not. Yeah, right. No, 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 no. It's okay. I I hope that I'm never consider myself recovered. Why would that, that be, Why would that be, Clayton? Today? No. Why would that be? Because I want to learn. Yeah. Because I can't learn if I think I'm recovered. That, yeah, that's I, what I, I say. I, you talk to any doctor, any lawyer, yeah. any professional out there, an accountant. Yeah. You know, if, if if they if they're not learning something new in their job every day, they're then they're typically bored. And I feel the same way about 
you know, my job and my recovery and, and whatever it might be, uh, if I'm not learning something different every day or, you know, at least open to the thought of learning something, I, I have to be open to the thought of learning something first. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite things that I ask everybody, and I, uh, I, I like to underline this and stress this to those who are starting their journey out. I hate to keep calling you a newcomer, but for those who are in their beginning days and months and first year of sobriety, you will you will have something that you will look forward to that happened to me. And I'm hoping, I know for sure Clayton will have his own um, share. But I've said this many times, and the very first time I realized that the obsession was lifted on me was one of the most glorious days of my new life. I took a deep breath and I looked up in the sky and saw the clouds parting and the sun coming down in San Diego, 70 degrees. And I thought to myself, I have not thought. And my manager told me, it appears to me that the obsession has been lifted on you. And I thought to myself, man, damn, you are right. I haven't thought about getting loaded or getting drunk or sneaking off and having a martini or a beer, feeling that feel. I feel right now healthy and alive and sober. That obsession. You remember that time when you felt that way? Specifically, yes, very specifically. I was about I was about four years clean, and I remember just like you described. One day I'm moving along in my day, minding my own business, and I realized that I had not about thought about drugs all day long. All day long. Yeah. I hadn't even had one thought of it. And it's like, what the heck is this? Yeah. Why am I not thinking like this anymore? Right. And and so I, I talked to my sponsor and 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 he assured me, he said you are he said you're doing incredibly well and he said he said, You know you know what our what 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 our book says and I said, Yeah and he says, Well, you you lose the desire to you, you know. Yeah. It, it, I don't know if you're familiar with my 12-step program, but uh, it, it says that you uh, can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't want to necessarily quote our literature because it's, it's not about that. But, right. But the losing the desire to use and the finding the new way to live has been just... The finding the new way to live has been probably the most awesome thing you know the losing the desire to use I'm, I'm pretty grateful for that yeah but but now it's now it's the finding the new way to live and that's a journey that's a forever journey you know and again that's why i'm not recovered i'm, I'm recovering <clears throat> because i'm still looking for that new way to live you know and when i learn something from somebody every day that's part of that journey yeah, and people say, what are the rewards of sobriety? And I say, you want to ask me? And I'll tell you. I'll tell you one of them is just listening to what Clayton said. Another one is realizing that when you're doing what your sponsor says and you're doing the hard work and you're not laying back and expecting all the – I remember when I first was in my uh, second recovery home in my first year of sobriety and everyone says, uh, hey, you know, you keep staying sober. The rewards uh, of sobriety are great. Um and I kept thinking, well, what, what is it? Give me one reward. Like, am I going to have a hot blonde pull up in a, in a, in a, in a uh, compact car with a boatload of cigars and money and say, hey, I got a job waiting for you when you get out of here. By the way, if you want to take me out for dinner when you get out of here, awesome. Is that a reward? What is a reward? And I'm hearing these people speak. And then I start realizing after the obsession was lifted, I started listening to people share. I, I didn't want to just be there. I wanted to actually consume everything they were telling me. Everyone. Yeah, one of the first rewards is that not having the obsession to use. Yeah, right? or drink. <laughs> right, absolutely. It was a yeah. gift. It was a absolutely. gift. Absolutely. And 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 for those of you who think no way, I mean, not necessarily say that, but those of you who are still being defiant and saying you just haven't surrendered yet, and that's the basic thing on you know our twelve steps. But when you actually finally do and you realize it's time to get busy with yourself, there is a new life. And, and there's just so many things about such a perfect way. What are your favorite things about being sober, Clayton, and being alive and being able to spread the your experience? What are your favorite things? 
Boy, that's a... It's tough, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, not... What, some of my favorite things are not living in fear anymore. Man, not, you know, no kidding. Fear of whatev- whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, not living in obsession anymore. Yeah. I, I pretty seldom these days get caught up in obsession, and, and I know how to work my way through it if if I catch myself in it, uh, which I typically do. Um, you know, just not, not not focusing on negative stuff anymore, not worrying about mistakes, being able to laugh at myself. That's one of the biggest ones is being able to laugh at, you know, either dumb stuff that came out of my mouth or dumb stuff that I did that, you know, that's obviously not going to hurt anybody or kill anybody. But, yeah, uh, you know, uh, being able to love people, yeah. you know, I, I, for the most part, I, I'll, I'll, I, for the most part, I don't like people. <laughs> uh, but there's, but there's people. I, that's 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 a true story. Right. For, for the most part, I, I I say this, and people laugh at me all the time because yep. I know so many people, and yep. I'm pretty connected uh, 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 with our community. And but but the truth is, for the most part, I don't like people. But if I'm standing here having a conversation with you, yep. I obviously like you, yep. and I, and I'm learning from you. Yeah. And that can be anybody, not just people in recovery. There's a there's a lot of people in this town that I truly do like, and I love their company, and I have, you know, great conversations with them, and and, and I want to, you know, have conversations about, you know, fun stuff, you know, about life, you know. There there there's one particular gentleman in town here that. Him and I are in the same business. And, yep. uh, we do the, we do the same thing, and him and I talk all the time. And, and I just love having conversations with him because we think alike. You know, we treat people well, and uh, we we try we try to treat people really really well, and and uh, be respectful to people, and and not arrogant. I, I I have a hard time with that. I try to be as humble as I can. At, at times, and uh, this guy's the same way, and so we sit and visit on the phone for for hours when we do talk. It it could be you know a month in between our conversations, but every time we have a conversation, I remind myself how much I like this guy. Yeah. And let me ask but, you this: uh, how many yeah. li- how many lives have you changed, Clayton? How many lives have you seen make a complete change? And what I mean by that is watching the progress of someone who comes to you and says, can you be my sponsor? Or do you have any um, words for me? I'm a newcomer. Um, and how is that not the greatest feeling in the world, watching someone progress right in front of your eyes? From, from It's the greatest feeling. In the yeah, world. it really is. I, right? it, it's, it's kind of funny because I, I, I sponsor, I've sponsored hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, but certainly hundreds of people um, over the course of 38 years. Yeah. And I get to watch them have these spiritual awakenings, and every time it happens, it's a spiritual awakening for me, too. Yeah. Because it reminds me that this works. One person helping another works. Yeah. Can I can I get in a room and speak to 1,500 people and change all 1,500 of them? Absolutely not. Yeah. But one-on-one... One addict helping another is what it says in my program. I'm not sure what the AA program says, but yeah. uh, that's how it works. I'm going to tell you and something. Then they're helping, and then they're helping others. That, yeah. That's the only way this works the, the very best. I'm going to tell you something, and I know that you can, you and I, I, I can just tell already we have a lot in common, and I, I know that, uh, I know that you can relate to this. I watched on Netflix one time that this old Tony Robbins special where he just goes up and he blows everybody away and there's thousands of them out there. And I remember used to thinking when I was in high school, I feared talking in front of people. I remember thinking there ain't no way I'm ever going to get in front of a big group, let alone maybe 20 people, and be confident and be at ease and share. And then I remember when I got out of, out of my uh, Recovery homes, two of them. And I remember when I started becoming and gaining more confidence and I was asked to speak, I was nervous as heck. But after that, I I couldn't wait to get in front of people to tell them the the joys of sobriety and to tell them why 
and 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 there is a way out that others can hopefully relate to and see us a, 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 a sun up above them that that's shining bright. I was no longer feared of talking in front of people because I was part of what I was brought up watching. I was part of watching so many people talk at ease, honestly and relatable to people who are battling it. And I remember thinking, I've got no fear now if I'm if I'm completely on. I remember, though, also, Clayton, I remember also when I was really fighting it and I was sent to um, outpatients, two of them, the same kind, two different times, and I, I relapsed two different times. And I remember going up and faking it and being nervous and scared and faking it and tell everybody how much I just couldn't wait to, to stay sober and I was doing the right thing. And I was lying through my teeth, man, because in the back of my mind, I couldn't wait to make that 10-minute walk back home and duck into a liquor store and grab what I needed and, and fake them again. Sure. But do you remember the first time when you started speaking and feeling that power and feeling, and I don't say power as far as braggadocious, I mean the power of being sober and spreading the word? That you have a message. A message. The power of knowing that you have a message. Yes, yeah, I, I do remember it. I, in fact, I was so afraid of speaking in front of people but because when I when I say that I generally don't like people, um, growing up I had really very few friends. And, yeah. Uh, the ones I did have, we had something in common, and that was using. Uh, so when I went to college, I, I was clean for a few years before I finally went to college. And um, what I did because I had this tremendous fear of speaking in front of people, is I, every quarter, that's back when we were on quarters, every quarter I and put myself into a speech class. Yeah. I made sure I had a speech class every quarter because I needed to get through this fear of talking in front of people. And I figured, well, what, what better way than in front of you know, complete strangers that don't even know me? I'm This will be good. Right. And it, and it really was, and it, and it helped me along the way. And, and I still get nervous when I speak in front of people, uh, when I'm when I'm asked to speak at an event or something like that. I still don't necessarily like it, and it changes every time. And I've had people tell me that, that what you said this time isn't at all what you said last time. That's and right. Said, no, I'm not a... I'm not a circuit speaker. No, I'm not. You're not going to hear the same thing out of my mouth twice, probably. No, uh, because I share what's on my heart or on my, you know, on my mind that day. So you know, I've like tried. If you and I have this interview tomorrow. It'd probably likely be different. I yeah, you're absolutely right. And I've learned. Here's the thing. It's funny. I'm laughing. I'm. I've learned so much from you, because normally the direction I take people is I want them to share their their life i want them to share how they got started in this and this and that and 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 i'm I'm not i'm not saying that i didn't want to hear that from you but right away i can tell that that immediately we needed to get to to talking about the power that you bring uh and the message of hope underline that so i apologize if we didn't get to your story but i could tell right away you didn't really want to you didn't it's not necessary with you i'm totally good with not going there (laughs) yeah see what you're there's doing no now, hope in that. Yeah, there's no I, I love that. See? Not to say anyone else that's come on here to share is not helping. No, no, no. No, no. No, no, no. Everybody No, I would never say that. I know you wouldn't. You do I know you, you man. Would. Yeah, you do you. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but 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 I can't my 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 time is limited. I uh, meaning uh, I'm not saying I don't have time for people. Right. What I'm saying is my time is limited. I look at everything as an opportunity. Right. If I have an opportunity of three to five minutes at a meeting, yep. my job as an old timer, if you will, I yep. hate calling myself an old timer, but let's face it. Right. Um, my job my job as an old timer is to spread a message of hope. Yep. I do not want to see a newcomer walk out of the door of that meeting not hearing hope. Yeah. Well... Is uh, let me ask you this: Are there any ways of people listening to some of your past work, or do you have anything online, anything like that? You sound like a professional guy who's been to many of these. Uh, you, you spoke many times. You told me before in front of big crowds, small crowds. Is there any way anybody can get any of your audio from any of your talks? I don't. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> not well, that, not I don't know if they could or not. That's okay. This this I'm hoping that this 
that this will be um, will encourage people to see what I to hear what I'm hearing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I've been dazzled by your honesty, and uh, I I love your. Uh, you know, we're already fifty minutes in. You know, and 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 for those of you who. Like I say, have listened to my podcast before and expect a long story or a, or a short story from somebody, and hearing the bad and this and this, for me, this has been fifty minutes of sheer gold of someone who um, has changed their life around, and I know that that's your main purpose, just like mine. And I'm not an expert. I forgot to say that at the very beginning, the very very beginning when I'm rolling into the music. I am not an expert. I don't have any credentials. I, I'll tell you what, Clayton, I would love to work in the field of recovery, but, you know, I'm too damn old, and, you know, you need to go to this and that. I, I probably could go to this and that and get credentials and all of that, but, you know, I'm doing what I love to do as well. I'm being on the radio, but I, there's nothing greater. Like you had said earlier, I've had people before that said, hey, I heard you speak years ago, and guess what? I was raw when I was in that front row, and I'm still sober. I'm six years sober now, and I heard you speak, and... um I remember that day, and I'll tell you what, that is, you can give me any kind of compliment that I've ever done in my career, radio, and that just does not even come close to what that person just did. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Those are the best compliments you get because you're, you're helping to change somebody's life, maybe save a life. Which you've done many, 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 many times. You've been a sponsor of, like you said, thousands of people. You've seen the good and the bad. You've seen the, the sad. The reality. You've yep. seen the sad, the reality of someone who drops off or just quits on themselves and doesn't want to do the work, like you said. Because uh, for the newcomers, there is some work involved. There is. But think at... There is. It's not... I mean, uh, I... You know, when, when, I, when I'm in meetings, I hear all the time, I hear how hard the work is, how hard the work is. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm a little careful with that because... Honestly, the work isn't that hard. No, it's not. It's not that hard. When you look back on it, it's not that difficult. I worked way harder yeah. at staying loaded than I ever ever worked. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Clean. Yeah, boy, it was I know a that. Time job. When I when I cleaned up, I couldn't believe how much time I had on my hands and money and, and money and saved and money saved. Quickly. Yeah, and money and money saved. Yeah, yeah, I had to find a hobby very very quickly. Let me ask you this that I love to ask everybody as well. And I've had debates on this, and I am always positive on my feeling is right because I'm a big shot, and I think I know everything, which I don't. But but this is my theory. I remember years ago I was telling somebody, oh, man, I had the worst dream. I went out, and I relapsed, and I remember sitting there, and I was drinking beers, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, crap, I relapsed. And the person would say to me, "That's not that's not good. Romo, have you thought about that? That's not that's not a good sign. Well, today I tell everyone that is a good sign. That's completely a good sign because that's my mind telling me. And I it's probably corny as hell to you, Clayton, because <laughs> you intimidate me with all your years of sobriety. But I love talking to you. In my mind, that's battle ready. That's telling me to always be ready, even in my dreams, that I'm just a slip away from relapse. Can happen anytime. Absolutely. One of my favorite deals, it, it comes from another uh, gentleman in the rooms of, of the meetings, um, and, and he heard it from somewhere else, and it, it's, it is, are you ready? Are you ready? You know, when that, when you get that phone call that your parent died, are you ready? Yeah. When you get that phone call that, or, or whatever it is, you know, when you're in a situation, in a at a party that you have to go to that happens to be in a bar, um, you know, celebrating your your wife's birthday or whatever. Are yeah. you ready? Yeah. And, and, it, and it can be anything. If you're in, a, in an accident and you learn that you are lost the use of your legs, are you ready? Yeah. You know? So, so yeah, I totally understand that. I, I just... Uh... You know, every time it's it's every time I wake up and I'm like, God, that was real, and good, good Lord, that was real, and good Lord, that was a dream. Because even in my dreams, 
my mind is working so sharp by telling myself, damn, you relapsed. And all the shame and all the guilt comes flying into those dreams. Those dreams are about oh, as real as yeah. possible. Yeah, Isn't that insane? <laughs> yeah, you wake up and it's almost real. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I've yeah. had those dreams. It's been an awful long time since I've had one, but uh, I remember them well. Having those dreams that you you relapsed and you're like, oh my God, what are my friends and my employer? Yeah. And oh, exactly. All these people gonna think? And you know, what about the the group? You know, what are they gonna think? Yeah. And, All those years of hard work, Bromo, you're lying to people. So real. Now. Bromo, your health is going to deteriorate like it did. Last. I don't have another relapse in me as far as my health is concerned. But you had said earlier, and I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, you had said something where you said, have you never relapsed, Clayton? I have not. That, And let me tell you this, as far as I think, because I have, my sponsor has never relapsed. I think that's rare. Because you've heard that old expression, right, Clayton? Well, it's part of the process. Like somebody will come in, and I'm not mocking them, but they'll say as an excuse, yeah, I relapsed. Oh, hey, dude, that's part of the process. What they want them to know is get back on the horse. I get it. But to me, that's kind of an excuse. Yeah. You know, it's part of the process. Yeah, I relapsed. Ah. It doesn't have to be. No, it doesn't um, have to be. Part Great. of the process. I, uh, uh, one of the things I talk about a lot when we talk about relapses, uh, and don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't, knock anybody down that's relapsed uh, i'm glad you made it back but yes uh, relapse is relapse is active addiction yeah that's not so so where were you when you relapsed were yeah. you in recovery or were you in active addiction yeah um, my, my guess is the emotional relapse came long 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 before the drink or the drug did yeah so the, that emotional relapse is the scary part you know when that starts happening uh boy look out well I'm glad you brought that up. Probably you, not far away from no, the real one. I'm glad you brought that up real quick because I want to bring this up. And this is one of the scariest things people will hear. Dry drunk. Explain to people what that means. Oh, my goodness. that's a, Right? To, to, to me, that's a person that's they're clean. Uh, but, a, but a dry drunk is a person that is basically put down the drug or the drink, whatever it is, yep. but they're not willing to change their life. Yes. They're not willing to change their behavior. They're not willing to change their spiritual self, Yes, if you will. You know, we, this, this, they're not willing to dive into the program and get to the root of the problem, if you will. Yes. Now, Clayton's not talking about going out and joining a convent or anything like that and going crazy. That's what he's he, what he means. Dry drunk is you're just flat, like just going from one minute to another, thinking everything is okay. I'm not. Well, I haven't had anything to drink or use or anything. Yeah, but what are you doing though? I mean, are you reading anything? Are you going to a meeting or are you talking about recovery with anybody? You're not. So. Yeah, you I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to swear on your podcast here, but you you take away the booze, <laughs> but 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 the a hole is still there. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know why I was All laughing there. is because I've had so many people say to me, and and listen, more power to you. And I'm sure you've heard this too, Clayton. I've had more p- people say to me, Ah, I quit just like that. I was a booze hound or I was a drug addict like my whole life. And just one day I woke up and I told myself, I'm done. And I've been sober ever since. And I remember looking at this person going, man, you're not part of the, uh, you're, you're very rare, sir. You know, uh, more power to you. So, and I don't quiz them or I don't ask them how they're still staying sober. But that always blows me away because, man, there was no way in hell I was going to get get and stay sober unless I had some work to be done. And I had to, I had to put over a year of my life in recovery homes. And I'm so grateful that I did. Here's another thing, Clayton, that you might laugh at. I once had a guy tell me, see, I went and stayed at a place for 120 days. And then I got on a list and I got that call and I moved into the city for nine and a half months. And I remember one of these guys, 
who came back and he goes, yeah, I was here back in, uh, I was in this house back in, uh, 92. And I got to tell you, sometimes I wish I can just take a vacation and come in here and live for a couple of weeks. I remember thinking, are you effing nuts? <laughs> because that was such a golden time of my life. And I'm like, yeah, are you mother effing nuts? And here's the funny thing. I just thought about this the other day. What a special time that was for me getting getting sober, living with a bunch of group of guys. It, what a special Absolutely. time. I'll never forget it. Ever. Yeah. Well, what, what the person probably failed to say is that they'd like to go back to that house knowing what they know now. <laughs> right. There's a lot of things I'd like to go back to knowing what I know oh, now. Oh, I know it, right? I'd like, to raise, I'd like to raise my kids all over knowing right. what I know now. Yeah, I'd like to play <laughs> Little League again knowing that I'm a lousy <laughs> right. athlete. But that's so true. They, yeah. for, they forgot about the dreaded um, um, hollow thoughts in your head, like where's my life going in your first week and a half in this place. They forgot about that horrible feeling like my life's in a toilet and I'm in a recovery home. There's no hope for me. I mean, there is every, I keep hearing everyone say that, but, but they forgot about those. What they remember though, years later is the, the bond that you have with some of the guys there and some of the things that you did and some of the right. tools that you picked up. I, I agree with what you had said earlier about there are some good programs and then there are some, not so great programs, but whatever keeps one person sober, more power to him. But what I, yeah. I do, what I do believe, Clayton, is a guy like you is a person, a man or a woman like you is so important to the to to what we we share. And I'm so grateful that you are on here. Yeah, I don't care where people find their recovery. I mean, yeah. I, I don't care if you find it in AA, NA, Overeaters Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, yeah. Sex Addicts Anonymous. Yeah. I don't care if you find it in the church. That's great. But whatever you do, wherever you go, wherever you find it, make your home there yeah. and get after it. Yeah. Go get it. Yeah. And you know you what I also it. say? Clayton, I tell them to be as honest with yourself as humanly possible. I don't care how many people you've lied to in the past. I don't care if you lied 20 minutes ago, but when you get when you want to start getting serious, just be brutally honest. Yeah. You got nothing Absolutely. else to lose, dude. I mean, just be brutally honest. You have everything to gain. I talk nothing so much sometimes. Sometimes people tell me to shut up, but like I've got only one tattoo in my life and it's on my arm and it's my sobriety date with the triangle and it's perfect and and uh if somebody asks me Man, I'll go off and like, oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. yeah, I've been sober. Blah, 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 blah. And this, I'm proud of it. Sure. And I remember, I remember used to hearing people say, "I'm proud of it." I'm like, dude, what are you proud of? You're a drunk. Yes, I'm a drunk, but I'm damn proud of being for the fact that I can have a podcast like this and have people like you on who can spread the message of hope. We lived through it. Yes, we do. And we live every single day. A lot, of, a lot of people didn't. Remember that, that room of people you were talking about that where, where, where two of them are going to make it? Yeah. Well, you're one of them. Yeah. You lived through it. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You've been on it's, it, it, it. It's gratitude is what it is. Yes. It's nothing, nothing less than gratitude. Nothing less than gratitude. And you know what? I got to ask you. I, you've been on now for an hour and two minutes. Sorry about that. But oh, I've been. Fine. What do you have to say to anyone, excuse me, who may be uh, tuned into this for the very first time? Somebody told them about it and said, listen, I'm a little worried about maybe you might use too much or you drink too much. Would you give this podcast to listen to and tell me what you think? What would you say to those who are trying to figure out which direction they want to go in life? Well... I guess one of the things that I would say is if, if you're, despite all efforts, despite all of your own efforts that you're using or drinking is still having negative consequences in your life, give this a try. Give it an honest year. Yeah. It's been, it's been one year 
from now, your life isn't like 10 times better. Yeah. Then by all means, go get all your misery back. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It's so true. It may not seem true at the time you're listening to this. No, no, it won't. It won't. But I, but I remember, I remember when I first cleaned up, um, my sponsor had me set a list of goals for myself. Yeah. Uh, like five things, I think it was, if I remember right. Yeah. And before that first year was even up, all five of those were accomplished. And then he had me set another list of goals, five things. And I think four months later, all of those were accomplished. It's pretty cool seeing that done, well, isn't it? It's pretty this cool. works. Yeah. Yeah. These are simple little things that I couldn't do on my own. Right. You know, be, between a, a, a sponsor and a, you know, a, a power greater than myself and, you know, whatever it is, uh, all of this stuff was accomplished. Every catchphrase that you hear, most of them are so dead on. Day by day, take it day by day, one day at a time. Yeah. One day at a time. Um, the you know, I, I, you know. the, the, the one day at a time thing, I have, I have something that I share all the time. It's, yes, we, we don't live, you know, when we get clean, we don't live like there's no tomorrow. That's, that's, that's not it at all. No, uh, <laughs> no, we, we have to plan for our future and things like that, but, uh, you know, today is what's in front of me. That's all I have to deal with is today. Now, will I wake up in the morning and I'll still be clean? Yeah, I probably will be, but pretty good, pretty good likelihood. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I don't have to stress about what's going to happen, you know, seven days from now. I, I need to make the best out of this one that's right here on, on my plate. Yeah, and a reminder to those, if you've ever heard this before, and my sister told me, and it pissed me off so bad, I remember on the phone when I had relapsed and I was really reeling and it looked like everything was going really downhill. She says to me, quote, you know, you can never drink again, right? And I remember thinking, well, thanks for that kind of pressure. You know, you can never <laughs> drink again, right? <laughs> nice. Nice. You never, you know, you can never drink again, right? I, I've heard that. So the fact that what... Clayton just said makes perfect sense because you put too much pressure on yourself and you think about that. You remember what my my old cook in our house said. Look, one day I may drink again. I probably will. But for today, I'm relatively sure I'm not. Really, we have today. Right. And we have our tools. And we have a guy like Clayton Meyer who just came on who spread so much, again, spread a message of hope. Clayton, I sure appreciate your time, pal. No, not a problem. I appreciate you. I know you hate me because I'm a person. I appreciate what you're doing here. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not like that. I could sit and talk with you all day. I am totally kidding you. I'm totally kidding you about the people thing. You know, what you just did and, and the thousands of people that you've sponsored and those that you've spread the message to, you've saved a lot of lives. And with this podcast, I'm super proud of. I have to thank you again. I learned a lot. I did too. I once again I got to learn something. If I can keep my mind open long and my mouth closed long enough, I get to learn great things. Clayton, thank you. Hang on with me real quick, okay? Thank you so much. Listen, I'll tell you that's what this podcast is about. It's about people who want to share. It's about people who want to come on and again spread the message of hope for anyone out there who says to themselves, "I give up." Man, I've been there. Clayton's been there. There's so many people that have been there. Again, you turn that corner and you see yourself heading to a new life, to a brand new day of hope. There's nothing like it. Again, my name is Bromo. Thanks for being with us. There is a way out. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? 
Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try.